Blog Talk Radio. Well, folks, welcome to one more edition of Politics Done Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Look, uh, thank you very much for spending this hour with me. Today is one of um, today is one of those days that actually one has to take pause based on all that's occurring in the country, but specifically one that is a bit more personal to me as a black man watching the occurrences that that's going on. Not only you know we look at it in in uh we look at this at what's going on in Ferguson, we look at it what's going on in in l a New York, all these different places, and you have to wonder what is happening in America, what is happening in America, what is happening in America you know um interesting enough uh Will this just be another black man executed by police, or will we finally do something about it? Yesterday, Michael Eric Dyson admonished President Obama for a rather neutral statement on the execution of Michael Brown. Is it time for the president to engage any further? I don't know. One of my previous CNNI report colleagues and friends, David White, thinks so. He wrote on one of my posts the following. Even with all the nefarious stuff, and you know he didn't use stuff, Obama has to endure via the racist GOP, is what he put. He should have further engaged the nation on egregious egregious police brutality on African Americans. Over the period of a month, we've witnessed a black woman being pummeled by a police officer a group of racist road cops in New York City choke a man to death, and now the shooting death of an unarmed teen in Ferguson. The time for PBO, President Barack Obama, to address race is now. A few months back, I wrote the piece, I was Trevon Martin the day I came to America. It is amazing that all black men still are. What are your thoughts? Let's talk. I will also be following our hashtag, uh, hashtag politics done right on Twitter. I mean, if you have something that you want to tell me and you don't want to do it on air, though I'm asking you to give me a call on air. I mean, uh, you know, I'm, you know, we're very nice and pleasant to everybody who calls. So, again, folks, the telephone number is six four six nine two nine two four nine five. Again, that number is six four six nine two nine two four nine five. Again, the hashtag is hashtag politics done right. Again, it's hashtag politics done right. Okay, what I want to do is start with that essay that I wrote because as I watched all these things unfold and watch the misinformation and watch the fear that some people have for black men and watch uh, what a whole lot of people are using as excuse. Well, you know, look how they act because as you know on TV, what you see is what raises the eyebrow of some and there is not a whole lot of context provided, even in, in, in supposedly, on supposedly liberal stations. It's sad. I just watched a video on Facebook today with a black guy coming on TV and saying, stop blaming all these other people and take care of yourself and all these things he's saying. The poor guy, in as much as 
what a lot of what he said is true. What he fails to understand is systemic oppression and how that actually affects. I mean, not the people you see on TV, though they are the manifestation. What you see on TV is a manifestation. But for that engineer, that doctor, that lawyer, and when I say that I'm talking about that non-white doctor, that non-white doc, uh, lawyer, etc., 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 that reality is prescient. Yes, you see it on TV in, in a different form, but in every part of one's life, that reality is different. But let me start with this essay. Again, the number, folks, is 646-929-2495. I'd love you to give me a call, 646-929-2495. Do not be scared of this subject because, as I said before, it's very easy to talk to a left to get engaged in what you're thinking, not what you think folks would want you to think because that's not how change occurs. Change occurs when one, is, one feels free to express themselves without being judged so that if their expression is wrong, they can be corrected, non-judgmental. And myself, corrected, non-judgmental. Anyhow, my first stop in America was, the, this is the essay. I titled the essay, I was Trevon Martin the day I came to America. This stuff went viral a few months ago when it was released on, in, on several platforms. My first stop in America was a little town called Brenham, Texas in 1979. Folks, it seems like we went off air, so I, as usual, I had to go to my backup uh, because the network sometimes gets a bit teary here, actually not here, but at, at Blog Talk Radio. So here comes my backup, continuing with the reading. Uh, continuing with the reading it goes as follows. I was wet behind the ears. That kid... That's, let, let me get back. I was wet behind the ears, black kid that spoke with an accent in a country town. The black American kid, kids were suspicious of me. The white American kids were curious. And the Hispanic American kids giggled when I spoke to them in Spanish. I hung out with Peruvian, Argentinian, Guatemalan, and Venezuelan, uh, uh, Venezuelan friends most of that year all strangers in a new land away from our parents for the first time who shared one thing in common. We could all communicate in Spanish, and when strange things happened, we could enter our cocoon, and it is amazing how quickly and quietly human beings adapt. We were walking down one of the few commercial streets in Brenham when some guy in a pickup truck just started shouting, Nigger! And if I remember correctly, something about being in the wrong part of town. It was directed solely at me because while we were all Latinos walking down that street, I was the only black one. I remember going to Padre Island for uh, spring break. Six of us packed like sardines in my car. I remember getting to the beach house and the coldness with which I was treated on the island compared to my geographic brothers and sisters from South and Central America. Funny thing is, they never had a clue. I always knew Blinn was a stepping stone to move up, and I moved up to the University of Texas at Austin after a year at Blinn to continue my engineering career. I had no problem getting in on my own merit. But most of my friends assumed I got in thanks to some quota. They did not realize as a foreigner I did not qualify. Both students and professors in many instances went out of their way to remind me that I was another. I rallied the campus of, for UT's divestiture from South America. Given their overtly brutal apartheid system, I understood that fighting injustices somewhere else told to hold up a mirror to the injustices we feel and we face locally. I remember being stopped many times by the police. It's not that I was a bad driver. Most of the stops seemed to have only to do with a desire to question me. It was never confrontational. I did as I was told. You see, where I am from, Panama, a dispute with an officer guarantees a cracked skull with no legal recourse. 
so. The cops in Austin likely thought I was a model citizen. From a young age, I always knew when and where to engage. I adapted. When I graduated from UT and went to work, I encountered the same preconceived notions. But work isn't the cops. I was vocal and never took any crap. Suffice it to say, I had five jobs in five years and finally formed my own company. When my company became very fairly successful, I moved to Kingwood, a nice suburb with a lot of trees and a very good school system for my daughter. My first memorable experience in Kingwood was walking in the trails and passing a white woman who immediately held her purse tightly and looked with, at me with horror. I looked at her and simply shook my head, seeing, seething. Another time I went cycling with one of my friends and stopped into a convenience store. When we left the store, my friend simply said, I get it now. I guess I was his first black friend. Inside that store, he saw how differently a person with my skin color is treated. In 2013, I've been living in the U.S. for 34 years. The fact that we still mourn our Trevon Martins and now Michael Brown means there is a lot more work for us to do. Preconceived notions and irrational hatred still pollute human interactions. Sometimes these weaknesses are codified into law. Black boys and men are stereotyped. Incarceration rates and crime rates are pointed to as justification for unequal treatment and fodder for false narratives. These numbers do not take into account the fact that young men in my neighborhood, a predominantly white neighborhood, do not dwell young men in other neighborhoods are arrested indiscriminately. It does not reflect that sentences on minorities are harsher and as such their chances of being granted parole and rehabilitation are small. There are many Trevon Martins out there. Many, it is sad that we have lost this beautiful young man. It is sad that we've lost a Michael Brown. Did Michael Brown have problems? Maybe he did, maybe he did not. We don't know. But the fact is, did he deserve execution? Well, some people do believe so. It is sad also that similar incidents occur frequently with very little news coverage. Trevon's case seems to resonate perhaps because he was 17, good-looking, and did not have a record. Every mother, respective of color, could envision him as their son, every father as well, and that touches our heart. We sense the pain that Trevon's real parents must feel the Amer in, in the America we envision, an America where there is no other. Such compassion for our fellow human beings is commonplace, and no one son deserved to do this. No way. Like I said, this was written last year, but I want to interject before I continue something real quickly, because... What the cops have, uh, have learned from the Trevon Martin case is that demonization by cop is also necessary when cop executes. And that is what they're doing with Michael Brown. Was Michael Brown a troubled kid? Maybe he was. But the execution style to justify the acts of the police require that the demonization be excessive. The demonization must take place. Think about it. How many people have been rough? the way we saw that video, assuming that was a video of Michael uh, Brown. How many people were that way who never got executed or who no one thought they deserved execution? Continuance with the, the piece. Many are emphasizing the fact that Mr. Zimmerman looked Hispanic. I am not sure why. Does this irrelevant detail somehow exonerate him from suspicion of a hate crime? Do they think that by presenting a narrative of minority on minority crime, they can diminish the meaning of this event? Do they hope that the news networks will lose interest if they are reminded that typically they have ignored minority and minority crime? What is important to note is that within the Hispanic community, there are many races, racism with uh, we know in this country is found in every country in Latin America. Many of my South and Central American friends could pass for white, just as Mr. Silverman can. They still struggle to assimilate. Ultimately, they did. Now, in the case here that we have today with Michael, Michael uh, Brown, things get a little different, don't they? Anyway, continue it. Many Americans want to see the Trevon Martin case as a potential learning experience. I do not think this is likely because we are resistant to the only real solution which involves everyone getting out of their comfort zones. The trial is probative. The attempt is to make dead Trevon Martin a stereotypical, dangerous, violent black thug in full vogue, is in full vogue. Some attempt to assume the only reason Trevon Martin have been shot is that he caused Zimmerman to do it, just like the only reason Michael Brown was shot is because he caused that cop to do it. You see, that cop wouldn't have 
executed him if he didn't do something deserving of a bullet or several bullets in his body. Just make believe this guy wasn't that black man, that black teenager. How would you feel? Would you react the same way? Many willfully attempt to make this plausible, even though Zimmerman followed Trevon as if he were a criminal. Citizens must speak up against the no-gun control bullies that use intimidation tactics and loads of, of money to insist upon lawlessness when it comes to deadly weapons. If we are to resolve real racial problems, we each must take it upon ourselves to lead by example, speak with honesty, and allow others to feel free to speak with honesty about what is in their hearts and minds without holding it against them. That's what I, and I mean that, folks. The only way you get across this, any kind of divide, is to confront the divide and not doing so assuming you will be judged. The only way you can be corrected or any one of us can be corrected is putting out the way we feel and being able to handle how we feel and being able to correct it for what we feel. Only when we've begun and maintain an open conversation about race and racism can we see past our preconceived notions and truly hear and see one another. Racism is not a problem with pre-assigned blame. Racism is simply a problem, and it belongs to all of us. Minorities do not have a monopoly on victimhood. The white majority does not have a monopoly on responsibility or guilt or anger towards those who have them feel guilty. The slate must be white clean. We must carry no grudges and begin by asking ourselves and, uh, and one another, is this the way we want to go on living, divided, lacking trust, lacking civility, lacking patriotism, not only love of care, but also love of Americans? Some of us resist asking such questions with openness because we fear we might end up losing something we think we now possess. But whatever it is we have now with the status quo, is it so wonderful that we wouldn't risk it for a higher level of understanding and a more fair, inclusive, and united country. Now think about it, folks, and give me a call. I would really love to hear from you all. And with that, 281320 is on the air. Who do I have the honor of speaking with? 281320. This is Cherie. How are you doing, Egberta? Cherie, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm Talk great. To me. I'm calling in to make a comment on what's I would going love on to today hear in America. Comment. Me as a mother of a black son, I am at the point where I am really tired and fed up, basically, because people want to say, why is it every time something happens to a black young man, the first thing other people other than black people, predominantly who I'm speaking of are white Americans, they always want to say, why does it have to be about race? Well, the reason it has to be about race is because of the way this country was founded. It was founded upon using the black man's back and his strength to build this country, but at the same time to let them know, as far as white people are concerned, that White people are superior, that the black man isn't even a human being. His life means nothing to this world, per se, or to America. Americans always want to speak and judge against people, especially white Americans, on people who don't look or act the same way that they do. I'm to the point to where I'm really fed up with it and I'm tired of it, and I'm going to speak out about it because it's my truth. It may not be your truth, but in my opinion, white America overall, they are born privileged. They get a privilege just by being white in America. Here in America, me as a black woman, I go through racism every day, all day. I live in the suburbs, and I see how it works living in the suburbs as a black woman. I've been stopped by the police and arrested by the police in my own neighborhood just because I'm black, and that's how I feel about it, because I 
ran a stop sign. The police said that I ran a stop sign. <laughs> Is that a reason to arrest someone? And they said I wasn't wearing a seatbelt. I was handcuffed in my neighborhood and taken to jail and placed in jail for 15 hours in jail. And I see how it works. As I sat there in the holding cell, a white man was picked up on charges of having an outstanding warrant for tickets that weren't paid in Bel Air, Texas. The Bel Air police came to pick him up from downtown. And what did they do for the white man? They told him, hey, We really don't want to waste time booking you, so is there anyone that you can call? If you can call someone and get them to come down to the Bel Air Police Station and get there before I get there with you, we won't have to waste time booking you. Just have them bring the money to take care of the charges that are against you for not paying a speeding ticket. But meanwhile, make sure you tell them, not to speed, but they can go at least five miles over the speed limit on their way there to pick you up. So I see how it happens every day, all day, and that's why I feel white people, in my opinion, feel as though they are privileged, and they are privileged just by having the skin color of being white in America. Okay, Sherry, let me let me say something first of all, because I think I, I hope you heard the entire essay that I read. Were you able to hear the entire essay? No, I didn't hear the entire essay you read, but I just okay, had to call to say this. It, yeah, it is that is that is an important statement. I want to say one thing first. I am in corroboration with a lot of different social justice groups, and the one thing that I that to, to entertain the conversation that I always try to maintain is that all people, meaning all white folks, all black folks don't have, and that's how I ended my thing, don't have a monopoly on racism or any of these issues. They do, folks have a monopoly, however, on power. And power is an essential factor in this entire in this entire discussion that I'm going to take a little bit further. Now, when it comes to privilege, we, in Move to Amend, uh, this is a national group that we work with, we do speak a whole lot about white privilege, and a large percentage of white people in our groups come out, and they would, they would actually come out and tell you they understand what the definition of white privilege is. The definition of white privilege is that just having that skin color entitles you to certain things that as a person I have to, that I am not to. I mean, it's a, it's a hard thing for many white people to grasp. It's a hard thing for many to grasp because they have not lived in your skin and seen the difference in treatment. And at the end of the, 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 the essay, that's why I, I try to tell folks, It is important that if we are talking about white privilege at times, that you don't fear coming on a a show like this. And if if you think what Cherie just said about white privilege is incorrect, I want to have that discussion in real terms. But anyhow, Cherie, stick with me. I want to bring in, I think this is John. John, come on in, my brother. How are you doing? Yeah, good afternoon, Egberto. How are you doing? So far, so good, man. What do you have to tell me about the white privilege such that my my friend in San Antonio? Well, I've talked about it before, and I totally agree with Cherie. I mean, white privilege has been uh, part of of our country's history since its since its founding. And uh, uh, let me, let me you know, stop you right there, John, because I need to tell Cherie. Cherie, uh, John is white. John is in the movement, and Jan, John understands all these concepts that we speak about. Continue, John. Great. Right, and uh, you know this is this is part of what what is you know holding our country back right now is that we don't we don't want to have a conversation about race, and it's you know it's a huge problem. I mean, we saw it uh, in so many different issues. We saw it with the Trayvon Martin uh, case. We saw it uh, with the all the things that were going on with uh, with Sterling. Uh, there was all the right. uh, uh, you know, we saw it even with the uh, 12 years of slave. You know, the the different polling that came out uh, 
you know, the difference between uh, Democrats and, or people who voted for Obama or voted for Romney, you know, the the relationship uh, and saying, you know, should 12 years of slave want, should have won Best Picture. I mean, it was it was only 10 percent of Republicans disagreed. Uh, and with Repub- with Democrats, fifty uh, percent agreed that it should have won. That that saw it, and so I mean, you see it everywhere you go, and uh, it's just a shame that we can't really address this. Uh, you know, Julia Ayafi did an article uh, for the New Republic, and uh, Chris Hayes interviewed her yesterday. Uh, and basically, she went to a a, a Starbucks in uh, in this, in basically in St. Louis, and it was mostly white. And I saw that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Tell a story. That's a great story. Well, I mean, people don't don't really want to address the real issues of what of what's going on, and they just they just uh, you know want to want to blame it. Uh, I mean, I don't I don't understand it. Uh, you know, I, I guess it's just it's just the racism is so ingrained in them that they don't. You know, they don't even really look at the full picture of what's going on. I'm trying to get a, a full picture of what's going on, and I was talking to that with my ni- about that with my 90 year old mother yesterday, and we were talking about releasing, uh, you know, the video and you know how that was absolutely unnecessary. And just within the last hour, it, we found out that the the Department of Justice uh, told. Uh, the the Ferguson police not to release that video, and if that really that, yeah, and if that video wouldn't have been released, they probably wouldn't have had the problems that started you know around around That's midnight. Right. Yeah, yeah, and so uh, you know I I do think that the DOJ and the FBI have been kind of slow on the gun to conduct their their review of it and i and nixon was just totally you know uh slow in his his assessment of yeah, what but I, was let going me, on i want to talk a little bit about the story that i think that that, that you didn't quite what so there there was this a uh, reporter that went into a starbucks and and this is a, this is rather important about how the community feel if you look at how uh, this whole um uh, execution is being looked at uh, and by the way, I am judging it immediately. That was an execution. I don't, you know, period. Um, but if you if you take a look at how it is playing around the country, because you have stations like MSNBC covering it, it, it actually looks like well, these people have uh, these people marching have an ally in 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 America against the Ferguson police. But then this reporter went into what what was her name? I don't remember her name. Went into yeah, Julia Julia Ayafi. Yeah, and started speaking, if, if it's the same story we're talking about, she started speaking to a lot of regulars in there, and they were appalled that all the media was out here. They were appalled that they were spending so much time with these people. These, uh, they were talking about these people as if they were not even humans. You know, to them, the death of that young man, it, you know, I, I saw a video today, and the video today actually had a black guy admonishing the black community for the way they were acting in the riots. And he was admonishing them because he was pretty much saying, that isn't going to do anything, and you look dumb, and you look X, Y, Z, he's talking about. And what he, you know, I I wrote back on, on the video, you don't understand systemic oppression, you don't understand these other issues. And for every one of those folks you see out there in public acting, let's say crazy or whatever, the amount of people in corporate America are working every day that has to go through what is systemic oppression, that it's being manifested in a different form there on the streets, that is what you should be looking at. You should be looking at, uh, so it, so there, he says, what about all those folks that shoot each other up in the neighborhoods every day? Yes, that's horrendous, that's terrible, but the cops, or the cops are the ones that should be there to protect against that, not that you should need to protect yourself. A lot of the white people in Ferguson, Missouri, that she spoke to, she was, I mean, this woman was actually shocked at the contempt that they had for the media that was coming into their community 
And not only for the media that was coming into the community, but for the people in the neighborhood. It, it you know, it, it just showed you a level of, um, and, you know, we we just keep hitting it, racism, 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 racism. I, I'm going to be honest with you. I just can't grasp it. But, Sheree, before I bring back John, do you have anything else that you want to add to, to this? Because well, I, you've been silent for a while. All I want to say is, is allegedly, he mm-hmm. sold cigars. Yes. So, justifiably, is it right for a police officer to shoot a young man no. in the back ten times? No, look. Uh, the the thing about it is uh, uh, that we shouldn't even be talking about this guy stealing from the store. He did it. His parents thinks that that was him on the camera. Okay, I mean they came out and they said that yes. I look. Uh, what what I saw that guy do on the camera is nothing I haven't seen. Right. I have seen kids in Kingwood come to convenience store, snatch things, and run. I've seen kids in Kingwood store push off on an attendant. I've seen all these things. I don't think anybody in Kingwood, Texas, or in any vicinity would say, oh, uh, that makes him an animal that deserves to be gunned down like a, like a thug. Okay? I, I, have, I don't think it, The only thing that would make anyone believe that is the stereotype that they have of a typical black man. Right, and that's That's because of what the media does. I'm a black woman, and when I watch television and you watch the news, it makes you afraid of who? Black men, because all these is portray the bad images of black men. And And yes, the the things that they're showing are true. Yes, the people did it, which is true, but there's just as many other races of people doing some of the same crimes that the black men are are, are, uh, committing, but that's not portrayed with the media. Why? Because the media always wants to instill fear. They always want to instill fear, and they always want to always, in my opinion, keep superiority stating that white is best and black is bad. So that's okay, let me, I want to correct one thing. I want to, or, I, I want to come in one second, because First of all, you're absolutely correct that uh, if you take a look at, me- at the media, and, and that is why I think, uh, Cherie, we have to communicate, right? Because <laughs> if you are a, if you are a let, let's say you are a white person sitting down in your white neighborhood and you're watching regular news and TV, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, I think you've just, you've just said it, that the media will give the impression that those black folks are dangerous. That is the impression that you that you get watching TV, and sadly, it, it was interesting enough. MSNBC, one of these guys said, you know, that's how many even black folks are predisposed to think about young black men because of the portrayal. There, nobody sees that the vast majority of people good are simply good. I mean, that's just point blank. The vast majority of people are not out there to get you, are not out there to commit crimes. But by putting the focus on a particular sect or group or whatever, it gives you pause. I, have, I, I do a radio show at KPFT, and one of the people there, we were t- talking, and you know everybody feels pretty open to talk to me because I really ask folks when I'm talking to them to tell me exactly what you're thinking. Don't, don't, don't try to hold back because you think you're speaking to me what you really feel. And the reality is what I got out of that conversation is a lot of people, while, you know, as liberal as they may be, while they, they, they see what the police officer, uh, what he did was wrong, they actually have within their being that somehow black folks uh, have a predisposition or some black folks have a predisposition lawless. Okay, you can get that from the discussion, and when you when you when you actually probe it a bit more, you see that they are actually conditioned by what they see on TV, by what they hear, and then the thing the question becomes, how do you get that to stop being the case? How do you mitigate that? And that is the kind of stuff as an activist myself and all of us here should be trying to handle. Because just saying uh, those white people are bad is not 
the answer. You have to say, how can I, I mean, because you, uh, if, if we're going to exist as one society, you have to somehow be able to say, how can I work with these people who have these wrong thoughts to have them corrected so that these things don't keep happening? Because those cops, I, I don't know if you see the video. There's a couple of cops that when he's out there trying to hold back the crowd, he's out there calling them animals. You <laughs> animals don't whatever. I don't know if you saw that one, John. Did you see that video that went viral? Uh, I didn't see that one, but I did read read that that particular line. Yeah, yeah, it's... and you know, and, and and that is who's there. Who should be there to protect you? Who thinks you're an animal? You know. So I mean, the thing about it is, what do you? And, and let me. This I should be throwing to you, John. In uh, how do you reach people? How do you reach people who have been conditioned to believe that? Fear of black men is justified. Well, you have to you have to understand the history of America and how how the white man has always pressed the uh, the black man, uh, and you also have, I mean in this you know to a lesser degree you know there's been all kinds of, of racism in this country uh, and still exists you know against Hispanics I see it here in San Antonio to this day. Even though it is getting better, uh, which is which is good, and I was very encouraged by when Obama came into office because it seemed like that there was more of a consensus, and I guess that was a a false narrative, or I guess there was a backlash to that to some degree. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, a lot of it is just is just having compassion, knowing history, putting yourself in their shoes, understanding, you know. Uh, why it sh- you shouldn't be that way, and then trying to to understand you know where where they're coming from. Uh, when I lived in New York City, uh, I, I moved there uh, I guess in 1990, and you know when I was riding on the subway, uh, there was a lot of there was a lot of people you know, and they weren't they weren't just African American, but they were all kinds of races, including white. That, that would uh, you know have kind of free reign on the subway late at night. There weren't as many cops, and the 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 rate of of crime was pretty high. And a lot of it was kind of scary to me, you know, because I you know even though I you know I love uh, the artistic expression of a lot of uh, great uh, African Americans, and I love the people who uh, you know were in the struggle for civil rights. I still hadn't really, you know, our, our city, San Antonio, is still very segregated, and so I didn't have a lot of contact uh, with African Americans. And so, you know, it was like I, I'd really, you know, I was trying to understand where they were coming from, but at the same time, you know, I was, trying, I was thinking, you know, uh, intimidating people really isn't the answer. And again, it wasn't just black people; it was, it was, it was, you know, Hispanics and white people too. And so, but, but, you know, so, you know, you just have to try to understand where they're coming from and, uh, and just not, not judge people at all by their appearance. Just, just, uh, you know, have, treat, treat people like you would want to be treated. And it, it is uh, amazing that that, that little, that little thing do unto others as you'd have them do unto you is so, it's still so powerful, John. But let me get 313 in here real quickly. 313, who do I have the honor of speaking with? Uh, yes, Egberto, this is Mike from uh, Mike. Lansing. How you doing, Mike? I'm Not glad you bad. called in. Talk to me, I'm my ho- friend. Yeah, I'm using a new microphone, and I want to make sure I'm coming through okay. Oh, yeah, you're coming through, and you're probably coming through better than I am. I had an Internet failure, so I have to use a good old backup telephone. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to me, Mike. Well, I, I know I sent you that email yesterday, and I, 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 you know, I was, I am still pretty hot about this entire issue, and I, you know, and and uh, yeah, I mean, it just shows to me a, a complete lack of progress or a, a stepping back of where we stand, you know, nationally. And uh, I want to stop you there because I got your email and I sense your frustration in that email. And that's why I told you, never let that frustration stop you from actually moving progress. First, feel that we've made progress. And I think this step backward 
is specifically because we've made progress. The Obama coalition that got formed, okay, is what America is ultimately going to look like. And th there are some of those, and, and this is what I try to tell everybody, there are some of those in this country that just don't want that form because it means they, they, they see a loss of power. And in losing that power from having a co coalition of this type, they are fighting back. So this step backward, I think, is to be expected. The question is, what do we do about it? Sorry for interrupting you, my brother. Come on back in. Uh, yeah, no, no, no problem. But I think that you know, President Obama being elected is where we saw the closet racist coming out, right, you know, and announcing what is going on. I mean, this has been going on a long time. Uh, um, the Trevon Martin part would probably be where I would start where the fuse got lit for you know um, lit for this uh, for what's happening in Ferguson. Ferguson didn't just happen all its, on its own, even though it's right. had serious problems. Um, and what I see uh, happening is uh, basically uh, uh, things going into a uh, you know is Ferguson the Fort Sumter you know of 2014. I think so. I actually do believe that, uh, but you know what? I don't know what direction it takes it, but I do believe to some extent it is. And why do I think it is? I think there are a lot of things that people are going to use believing that they can work on people's fears for this next election. So everybody right now, both on all sides, are figuring out how they can create a narrative that chops the best part of the American population. That is going to continue. And the thing about it is, who is going to get the correct narrative? And my, my contention is that we must get the truthful narrative because the truthful narrative is what, gotten correctly, going to get the folks out there to the polls to vote. And that is what we need. But stay with me, Mike. I want to bring in a 414, and I'll be back to all of you. Um, 414, who do I have the honor of speaking with? Uh, Bob from uh, Wisconsin. Talk uh, to me, Bob. The comment that was made regarding media purposely trying to promote a kind of or or to to encourage racism, I think ignores the fact that media is first and foremost about making money. Right. And if it leads, it leads. And right. if you can have violence and fear, that's what's going to motivate the media. It's not a matter of their being racist. It's a, they, they may be racist, but the fact of the matter is it's a far more deeply systemic problem where profit motive and the ability to sit there and appeal to the more base instinct of the viewer or the consumer of media is being exploited for economic ends. And Bob, the you know, Bob, Bob, Bob I want to say one thing first of all. You're correct, but it's even more deep than what you're saying. And let me put it in, into perspective. Um, the, the, plutoc oh, the American plutocracy needs to create a certain level of division. Otherwise, think about this. If all people, and Michael, I lost you. I don't know what happened. Um, but call back in, Michael. Uh, think about this, Bob. Think about all these sects, S-E-C-T, all these different groups in this country deciding to get together on economic issues, on their economic well-being, what do you think happens in this country? In other words, if white people yourself, I'm assuming you're white, of course. Yep. Uh, okay. If white people start to say, wow, we're not worried about uh, this conflict between black people. We are going to get together to make sure that we all grow together, that we realize that there is economic uh, disparity that is killing the middle class, that it's destroying the poor. If we all get together, we're really going to finally have our eyes on those that are really creating havoc. It isn't the immigrant that's creating the problem. It is that the plutocracy, the, not even the 1%, but the 0.1% that has the capital to export jobs to slave labor and make us more poor, that's the problem. If those I mean, guys get together, that's a problem. I'm and in absolute agreement. Absolute agreement with what you say. We have plutocracy in place. We have the moneyed interests controlling too much. And the issue of racism is just a tool 
that is being used. One that's Fine. true I, there. I am, true, true it there, is, there, but, but you know what? You know what, Bob? Bob? Guys like you, okay, in your community, in John's Please, community, me. you have to be out there as a white guy, reminding oh, a yeah. lot of the guys that are going to listen to you that that is the reality, right, John? Absolutely. Continue, Bob. No, just it's just the issue that has come up with the expression of racism uh, through the militarization of our police department is really just symptomatic of a far more profound problem underlying it, which is the the where the moneyed interests are and the fact that our media is controlled for moneyed interests to make money and not to serve the public interest at all. Right. I mean, to expect to expect the media our commercial media at least, to actually be fair or balanced or anything is sort of dreaming. And uh, to sit there and blame media, I would prefer to say, I would prefer to blame the fact that they are successfully appealing to our more base instincts. And the fact is, right. like commercials, like advertising, it works. Right. The fact is, people do watch when it bleeds. Right People now, Bob. Uh, Bob, I tell conflict. you what we have to do, Bob. Bob, I, I tell you what. We, you're you're correct, and the the thing about it is, um, I don't want to forget to make this statement to everybody out there because a lot of people aren't talking about it. Net neutrality, folks, is very important. It's what allows all of us to have equal access to the internet. They're trying to fight to to remove that ability. And uh, note what Bob talks about the news media. What Bob talks about the news media is correct. We cannot count on that as as news. News is going to come from independence, yourself, me, you. All of us are going to be the media, or all of us are already the media in the communications that we do, in the blog talk radios that we can do over the Internet. But if these guys get net neutrality, uh, re, re, uh, if we no longer have net neutrality, they will be able to shut down these channels as well. But, Bob, I need to get my friend. I see, I think, who is this here? Uh, uh, come on in, it's 620, zero. Jack. Yeah, well, <laughs> How you doing, Jack? <laughs> yeah, Talk well, to me, well Jack. Two, uh, maybe two things. Give me, give me a moment. All right, that was the first, uh, as far as the racial things, uh, uh, I was the first, uh, we had the first fraternity, uh, we, as far as I know, we go back to college days in 1950. Beta Sigma Tau had uh, blacks, uh, 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 so your white Indian, fraternity had the first black folks first, in it. First, uh, number two. <laughs> number Talk two is, uh, uh, what was I going to say? Number two uh, was, uh, I did a study. It was a part yes, of a sir. study. Uh, I am familiar with Ferguson Forest. It was mm-hmm. back in 1963, 1965. Now, they had... Juvenile delinquency back then. Right. They did a study of the 1960s. I believe it was mostly white. Uh, from right. Ferguson. Uh, but Ferguson was said with force. And uh, uh, as far as that, and I, number three is I, somebody asked me on Facebook, uh, somebody commented, I never were, I never got. Uh, Touched by the police, involved with the police, and uh, as asking, uh, stopped by the police, asking if I, uh, my identity or anything like that. And that's true, but so what? Uh, I think uh, the thing that need, needs to be done is this uh, racial thing. And uh, I, I never was, uh, I never was for, uh, for it. I, I know exactly uh, what you mean, Jack. Jack, let me get um, let me get Mike back in a real quick side, and then I'm gonna give everybody their 15 minute, I mean 15 second closeout. So uh, put your thoughts down, Jack, and I'll be right back to you, my friend. Michael, you, you're back. Yeah, sorry, I'm I'm having technical difficulties with myself trying to get this to work, but I'm gonna make this real quick. Uh, you know, our backs are up are up against the wall. You can only take so much, and um, the time has come to. Uh, um, to say, hey, no more. You know, um, you know. I don't care if you're carrying a Confederate flag or not. It's time, you know, um, to to make your choice. You're going to follow the United States flag. 
we want to follow the Confederate flag, you know, if, and and that's about it. I'm ready to, you know, I'm ready to say, hey, enough. I've been quiet too long. It's time to go. And I think it's going to take a lot of people like you, Mike, to use the platforms that we have. Um, I'm going to uh, start discussing also with Coffee Party, instituting some sort of a mechanism that we can do or that, uh, extend the kind of media that we do because I think it's going to be very important that we that we do it above and beyond the crazy media that we have that Bob spoke about because, you know, if, if that continues, uh, you're right, we're done. But I, I tell you, there's something important coming along in 2014, and that is um, if 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 – Democrats lose the Senate in, the, in 2014. Uh, there's going to be a whole lot of hell in the country because we're really going to have a non-functioning state. So, I mean, I, I hope a lot of this, a lot of what's going on here kind of get people out there to not forget their civic duty. Cherie, you haven't spoken in a while. Yeah, I'd just like to say that I think everybody needs to stand up and basically I know it's a lot of power with money being behind it with the American media, but just kind of let them know, hey, we're sick and tired of you portraying, you know, black people as being the villain all the time. Yeah, a lot of the crimes that they show on the media, yes, of course, there were black people involved, but at the same time, there's just as many other races of people committing the same type of crime or worse. Why don't you portray that on television? And we need to stand up and say, stop portraying black as bad and trying to instill fear in others because we know that it works. It sure does. It sure does. Uh, go ahead. The, the fact is that it does work and that the primary purpose of media is to make money is why they use it and why they will continue to use it and why it's ridiculous without any power for us to tell them not to make money by exploiting the fears. I mean, it could be the Chinese. I mean, it was for how many years? Uh, you know, the Chinese were the bad people, and they were exploited. And, you know, when you wanted to do, if I just read something about the fact that the cocaine was made a schedule, you know, was made as bad as it was, was because the Chinese were using it back at the turn of the century when they were building the railroads, and they needed to be suppressed, or at least they needed to be made. They need to be made the bad guys. So you know, cocaine was uh, made uh, uh, you know, unacceptable. The same thing with marijuana and the Mexican, or I shouldn't say the Mexican, the the, the people who used. Uh, marijuana extensively, and it's it, you know all that business. It's still a matter of ma of of exploiting the fears of people of the new, the different, and um, for commercial ends. And as long as commercial interests dominate, then we can't expect fairness. We really cannot, and we have to change that idea of what media is supposed to do. You know, broadcasting in this country set up in 1934 was supposed to serve the public's interest, convenience, and necessity. I don't see that being done. I haven't seen Absolutely it done in the not. last 50 years. So Absolutely not. Look, I, get, I tell you one thing, guys. I have great callers. I mean, when I put this title out there, I said to myself, I want to see what my audience is going to look like uh, today. And I can tell you one thing. I am a happy camper because, again, we together, uh, the, the folks that I see on, on, on not only here on the um, on voice but on commentary, I am ecstatic. Um, I want to say something specifically to Michael. Michael, you said, or oh, it seems like we're going backward. While it may seem that way in the media, we're not going backward, my brother. We're going forward because the responses that I've seen, yes, I've seen the negative ones, but when it comes to thoughtful, real responses from people, black, white, and otherwise, I can tell you that that's what I'm getting. I'm getting the coalition, and the coalition is what's going to ring. So, look, folks, we're getting at the end of the show. I'm going to give everybody 15 to 20 seconds to say a final comment. Cherie, starting with you, my dear friend. Well, basically, I'd just like to say that wouldn't it be nice if we could just all get along? <laughs> I think, look, our our show here shows that we can all get along when we put our minds to it. Thank you for calling in, Cherie. You're welcome. Talk to you later. All right. Jack. Okay. Uh, didn't get a chance to talk to very much, uh, but uh, 
I am going to be joining the coffee party pretty darn soon. Excellent. It's just a question of uh, of uh, call me when and uh, give me the number to call. And uh, 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 I love this uh, Jean, Jean K. Uh, I didn't have a chance to talk to her. I didn't have a chance to talk to uh, uh, Eric. What's her name? What's his name? Uh, Air, Air, uh, first name was Bob or something like that. Right, Bob. It was Bob Erickson? Because uh, that Monday night, I'd like to talk to him. Uh, uh, so I feel he's a buddy. He's a, he's a good buddy. Uh, <laughs> yes. For some well, funny look, let me, reason. Let me tell you something, uh, Jack. I got more I got conservative. To give you your Jack, uh, I got to go. But here's if you you remember, you are part of this family, my brother. Okay. You're a part of the family. No, they're not a enjoy... pay yet. <laughs> That's okay. I I enjoy having you on this show every week, my brother. So we we'll keep talking. You keep you keep calling in, my friend. Okay, Bob. So Bob, you're on. Yeah. Uh, basically, I just think that we need to be aware that the problem is too greatly within ourselves, and the fact that our our less our lesser natures our more gross natures are being appealed to first and foremost. Our emotionality is being appealed to by media, and that we have to keep that in mind, that we've got to stop trusting commercial media and uh, be aware that the interest, the moneyed interest of the, uh, the owners and operators of media have got to be distrusted, and we've got to find other mechanisms of uh, communicating and figuring out what we really want. Bob, you're absolutely, Amen. Uh, you're absolutely correct, and please remember, stick uh, here with Coffee Party. That's what we're going to be doing, alternate methods of informing. Michael, you're up. Yeah, I I, I just say amen. That, Thank you, know, you very much, Mike. That, Go ahead, Michael. No, I just I just want to say amen to the, you know to, uh, to the last comment. You know, oh. it's time to look at overseas. It's time to look at overseas news feeds and not just the ones in the United States. Excellent. Thank you very much, Michael. Okay, Jean, you got 30 seconds. Yeah, I, I disagree. I, I think, you know, I think you're, you've taken this whole media thing to, to where you've lost the sight of of what the real issue is. The real issue was the death of this kid, and I, in my opinion, the media has been not great, but a but little bit better than fair. And it's because I depend, I trust the media that I refer to, which is a lot of it are left wing bloggers. But I think uh, when you say things like, uh, you know, you can't trust the media at all, or you say things like, you know, that every person, like on MSNBC, let's say a Rachel Maddow, has to put something before their corporate uh, bidders before they approve it, is a total false dichotomy. It's completely false. They they do not do this. I mean, you know, things have changed drastically. You know, ten years ago there was no liberal voice at all on television. Let me tell you, uh, John, I, 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 I know what you're saying. I think we spoke about this before. Let's let's have an entire subject on this. I don't think any of the people that spoke before really uh, took it to the level that maybe uh, you picked it up on. I I think what they mean is the general. In general, but I, I, let's talk about that another time because I have to close this baby out. Uh, folks, please remember we have three shows on Coffee Party Network. We have Press 1 for Democracy with Dan Aronson on Mondays at 10 p.m. Eastern. On Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern, we have Lunch with Loudon. And, of course, Saturdays, you're here with me, Politics Done Right with Egberto Willis. Look, folks, I appreciate the hour that you gave me. You guys have a wonderful Saturday and the rest of the week, and I'll talk to you on Monday from KPFT.